let me introduce two more people to you. So a dear friend of mine is sitting here, Dave. Uh, he's one of the uh, team that lead Oak Hall Church. And uh, um, Dave, thank you that you can be with us this morning too. He's spoken to us before about the work in the prisons that he's involved with. And you may remember uh, him telling that to us. But also, Heather is somebody that you know very well. She's part of your church family. And uh, Heather's going to come to read to us now from the passage that we're reading this morning. So we're going to read Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 to 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Thank you so much, Heather. And then um, Heather, after that, actually, Heather, would you mind reading it up here? Yes. Because this is the secret window just here. You might wonder why there's a, a camera here. It's because that's how um, um, James and Emma and others can see us this morning. So um, thank you. So he Heather's going to read to us and then she's going to pray again that God would speak as we, as we study this passage. Thanks, Heather. So the reading then is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Jesus taken up to heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so, praise the Lord indeed. Let us pray. So, Heavenly Father, we do thank you from the bottom of our heart that indeed you sent the Lord Jesus Christ into this world to be our Saviour. And praise God that he died for us and he rose victoriously. And as we have read in your word, Lord, one day he's coming again. And we thank you in the meantime that you have indeed sent your Holy Spirit in this world so that people can know him personally in their lives and his power. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray now for Andy that as he opens up this word this morning, please, Lord, speak to us all by your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you indeed anoint uh, Andy 
as he speaks and shares the word this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks so much um, for reading and for praying for, for us. Just to give you a heads up over the, ne the next few minutes, so we're going to be thinking about this passage now for about 20, 25 minutes, and then um, Chris is going to continue to lead as we then can respond, two or three of us in prayer, and then we're going to uh, close and have that opportunity to chat outside. So uh, that's the, the next little while. A little bit uh, longer horizon. Um, today, um, I'm here, and actually for the next two weeks, I'm going to be returning. So um, we're going to be just having a short series of three as we look through the first two chapters of Acts together. So I'm looking forward to be able to share uh, just more than one a week on its own, but to rather to come back for the next two as well, if that's still okay with you at the end of the morning. Well, Acts is a wonderful book. And um, you may know and that this book has been written by Luke. And in fact, a quarter of the New Testament has been written by Luke in two volumes. First volume is Luke's Gospel, and second volume is Acts. And that's where we're diving in uh, this morning. So we're coming in into the beginning of the second of two books um, that Luke has written. And this book is unique in its record of the, what the church did next, or what the Lord Jesus did next um, after his death and his resurrection. And I've been thinking, like, what should we call this morning? And very simply, the name of our talk this morning is Jesus Continues. Jesus Continues. I'll explain why that is the title in just a moment. But Jesus Continues. And we're going to be thinking about three things this morning. Three things that Jesus continues to do. The, the first is that he proves that he is alive. He proves that he is alive. That's the first thing. He proves that he is alive. The second thing is that he promises the Holy Spirit. He promises the Holy Spirit. He promises power. So Jesus proves he's alive, he promises the Holy Spirit, and the third thing is that he is poised to return. He's poised to return. Those are the three things. So he proves he's alive, he promises the Holy Spirit, and he comes to the place where he's now poised to return. So that is what we're thinking about this morning as we think about this theme, Jesus Continues. Now, you might want to just look down at verse 1 of chapter 1. Luke is writing. He's writing to a person called Theophilus, which means one who loves God. And so I think many of us could be counted there. And he says, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. But now... We might lean forward and say, but, but Luke, Jesus has died. Now, how can Jesus, how can you say that that first book was about what Jesus began to do and teach? Surely it's what he began and finished doing. That's the end of the story, surely. But Luke is saying, no, that first volume was about what Jesus began to do and teach because Jesus continues Jesus, his work doesn't stop there with his death and his resurrection, his ascension. Jesus continues. And that is what Luke wants us to know. That's what the Holy Spirit wants us to know as we begin to read this book together. How about us? How about you? You know, we've heard wonderful testimony this morning of God's work right here on this patch of how God has done amazing things right here in Sarmerstead. Do you believe that God can continue, that Jesus will continue his work? Well, the message of this morning is yes, Jesus continues. 
maybe you are at the poised for a change of circumstances, situation changing. Perhaps your children are about to leave home and head to university, or perhaps you're about to move to another place, or perhaps you're about to go to study somewhere, or perhaps you're about to begin a family, or perhaps you've just moved in, and you have stories of God's wonderful work in the past. And we come together this morning and we're saying, Jesus, you've done such wonderful things in the past. What about now? What about next? What about the next chapter? And the theme of this morning is, well, Jesus continues. Jesus continues to work. And that is the wonderful message that Luke wants his readers to realize right in this first verse. Yes, Jesus has done and taught glorious things as he was among his disciples, but that was only what he began to do and teach. Now he is going to continue. And we can head into today and head into the weeks and the months ahead with that same reassurance that the same glorious Jesus continues to work. Now those three things. The first and this is absolutely key to the Christian faith. And if you are here this morning thinking to yourself now, what is the heart of the Christian faith? What is it about? What is it that these kind of Christian people believe? Well, here is something absolutely fundamental and at the heart of it all. And in fact, later on, a very important New Testament writer would say that if this hadn't taken place, if this hasn't happened, then the Christian faith is worthless. There is no point in it whatsoever. What am I talking about? Well, it is about the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus, he really died. His enemies and his friends could testify to that. And his body, his physical body, was laid in a tomb, cold, dead, and it was sealed with a stone, and then there was a guard put on that. On that too. It was the end as far as everyone was concerned. But on the third day, that stone was discovered by some of the women to have been moved away. Jesus' body could not be found. That crack set of troops who had been set to guard the, uh, the tomb were now trying to work out excuses for why the body had disappeared. And then, for the next month and a week, and a little bit more, Jesus, risen, kept appearing to people. Now, some people might say, well, perhaps that was a hallucination, this one person over there, or that person over there. But then, he appeared to 500 people all at once, a crowd of people. And he ate with his disciples, and he taught his disciples, and he talked with his disciples, he even cooked for them. Because Jesus was alive, he had risen from the dead. And Jesus didn't just want his disciples to take the word of one or two people, but for 40 days he gave, it says here, let's have a look. In verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now we could spend a whole day thinking about the proof for the resurrection. But the Christian faith isn't about turning off your brain and shutting your eyes and leaping into the dark. That's what people in our culture think faith is. But no, the Christian faith is about examining the evidence, exploring the proof, seeing who the person of Jesus is, and on the basis of that evidence, putting our trust in the Jesus who died and had the authority to rise from the dead. It's wonderful news. Jesus is alive, and he is the center of the Christian faith. And Jesus wanted to give convincing proofs that he was alive, so that even now, in the 21st century, we could look back through history and also be convinced that in history, Jesus died and rose from the dead. 
Some philosophers have said that the Christian faith is unique. Well, it's unique in many ways, but one of the ways that it's unique is that it can be examined and tested in history, this question of whether Jesus died and rose again. And if you are examining the Christian faith this morning and weighing up these things, we, we would love to give you a book that speaks about the evidence for the resurrection and perhaps to talk more about that and explore it. There are people who have in the past decided they were going to disprove Christianity by proving the resurrection never took place. And then as they examined the evidence, just came to the complete opposite conclusion. No, in history, Jesus really rose from the dead. So if that's you this morning exploring these things, well, please come and talk and we can point you to some great resources that will help you to see the historicity of the resurrection. So the first thing is that Jesus proved that he was alive. The second thing is that he promises the Holy Spirit. So in verse 4, we suddenly zoom in. Um, it's like a, a film scene. We've had a, a, the wide shot. We've had the, uh, the lines that Jesus has given many convincing proofs. And now we zoom in on one moment where Jesus is speaking with his disciples and it seems that they're eating together. In verse 4, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we've zoomed in on one occasion here in verse 4. Jesus is eating and he's with his disciples. And he tells them now not to leave Jerusalem. This is the end now of the 40 days of Jesus appearing. Earlier on, he's met them in Galilee. He's cooked them breakfast on the shore of Galilee. He's met with some of them walking on the road to Emmaus. He's met with Mary right outside the tomb. He's met with the 12 while they were meeting in an upper room. Now then, into Galilee, they've come back and Jesus is eating with them again. Perhaps they're getting used to it. They think this is just gonna go on for, for years now. This is the new way things are gonna be with Jesus all the time eating with us. But now he gives them this instruction. Don't leave Jerusalem. Don't go away anymore. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Each of the Gospels begin with this kind of phrasing that John baptized with the Holy Spirit, but one is coming. John says, one's coming. I'm not even worthy to touch his sandals because he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And John, he directs his disciples to not follow him any longer, but to follow Jesus. I must become less, he must become greater, John says. And so all the Gospels begin with this intriguing phrase. If we were his disciples, we could see John baptizing, putting people under the water, lifting them out. And then they'd walk out of the waters of the Jordan, determined to live a different kind of life now, overwhelmed by the water, but with this decision to live differently. But now Jesus is saying the fulfillment is coming when men and women will be washed, cleansed, baptized by the Holy Spirit. And the disciples don't know what Jesus means. And so in verse 6, they gather around him and they think maybe this is a political moment. And they say, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says in verse 7, don't worry about that kind of timetable. Don't worry about those kinds of political things. The important thing in verse 8 is this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Oh. Amen. So Jesus promises them 
that they are going to be given a power that is from God. Now, when I was reading this passage and rereading it and colouring in, which is the way that I try to engage with the text, I realised that earlier on, we've already had this phrase about the Holy Spirit. In fact, it was right up um, in verse 2. There is Jesus giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So you could rewind back into the end of the Gospels. What does it look like when Jesus is giving instructions through the Holy Spirit? But as you read at the end of the Gospels, Jesus is speaking. It's because everything Jesus did was by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Spirit of God, Jesus ministered. And now Jesus is saying, wait here, don't move, be still, because you will receive power that when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And his power will enable you to be Jesus's, to be my witnesses. And he says about these different borders, he says that you'll be witnesses right here in Jerusalem. That's the familiar city, the place where they are. You'll be my witnesses in Judea. That's the region that they're based in. You'll be my witnesses in Samaria. That is actually enemy territory and to the ends of the earth. And as we read on through Acts, we'll find that Luke is pointing out as these borders are broken and as these spirit-filled disciples do take the good news of Jesus and speak of him boldly despite great opposition in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I'm sure that the disciples were saying to each other, right, well, next time Jesus makes us breakfast or next time we're on the road or next time we're sharing time together, we're going to ask him more about this. What does he mean exactly? What's that going to look like? But now, in verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. This was day 40. This was the last day of Jesus appearing to his disciples. And they've got so many questions and they sense their weakness and their inability even to go to the next village, let alone to the ends of the earth. They've had his instruction to wait. They've got so many more questions, but Jesus is taken away. Now, on other occasions, Jesus has disappeared from in front of their eyes as they've uh, broken bread having made that journey to Emmaus, or Jesus has just um, moved out of the room and then not been there. But this time, this exit seems final and seems different, and they realize very soon that this is the, the final exit. Jesus has been lifted up, and if you like coloring in words like I do, you might want to later color in all the places in this last paragraph where it speaks about him being taken up into heaven, beyond the cloud, into the clouds, beyond their sight. All of it is speaking about how they're all looking up, looking up, because Jesus has been taken up in a way that is different from any other time in these last 40 days. And they realize that, that Jesus has, has gone in a different kind of way. And in verse 10, they're still looking up into the sky. And it's as if they don't even realize that two others have joined them um, because they're still looking up into the sky. Perhaps the other two look up as well as they stand beside them. In a moment, they're going to realize that they're dressed in white. But in verse 11, these men dressed in white say, men of Galilee. That's a loaded phrase, actually. You see, they're not from Jerusalem, they're not from the university city, they're not from the place with the, the big temple, the heart of it all. They're from the land of darkness, people would say. They've got an accent that gives them away. They're only fishermen, some of them. They're just kind of simple people. And now these two men dressed in white, they say, men of Galilee. And it's almost like a, ooh, a cut to the heart, because, yeah, I know, we're, we're not on the inside, we don't know all the... We don't know all of the, we haven't had all of the education or the history or the right family. Men of Galilee, it almost underlines their weakness and inability to go and 
turn the world upside down. Men of Galilee. But they say, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus has been taken to heaven. And we're going to see at the end of our third study that he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the one with God's authority. He's the one with the authority to pour the Spirit of God out on those who call on his name. And he is poised in the words of Psalm 2, where he waits for the enemies of God to be made a footstool for his feet. He is poised, the King of Kings, to return glorious and the winner, triumphant. He's poised to return. Well, this passage is, is exciting. You could, you could uh, perhaps want to read on over the next days and uh, just read on through Acts and be delighted again as to what Jesus continues to do. But we've seen first that Jesus proves that he's alive. Jesus is alive. And if you follow the Lord Jesus, you are not following a dead character from history, but you are following the risen, victorious, living Lord Jesus. Amen. Second, he promises his Holy Spirit. And if you are following the Lord Jesus, then he will equip you and empower you by his Holy Spirit, not just to be empowered to speak as his witness, but that Holy Spirit's power is the way that he washes and cleanses you. It's the way that he lives in fellowship with you day by day as Heather prayed just now. It's by his spirit that we have fellowship this morning. He is here among us as he fills those who call on the name of Jesus. As we head into this week, if you are a follower of Jesus, then let's ask that we would be deeply aware of the Holy Spirit's power with us to enable us to be his witnesses, to enable us to live in a dynamic, fulfilling relationship with the God of heaven. It's by the Holy Spirit of Jesus that we can live in relationship with God. And that Holy, his Holy Spirit can come to those who call on the name of Jesus. And thirdly, well, let's live in the light of the fact that the king is poised to return. And he may come back this week. He may come back the week after, or it may be many years to come. But we want to live in the light of that king, who is the king of kings, who is the enthroned one, the name above all names. We want to live in the light of the fact that he is poised to return. We want to live for his gaze and for his as this week unfolds. We're going to pray in a moment before we hand back to Chris. But also, perhaps there's some of us here this morning who've never put our trust in Jesus. And perhaps you're thinking, well, I want to investigate that more about that resurrection. Is that really something that happened and can be examined? Well, do have that conversation. And we'd love to help you see some of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. But it might be that some of us here this morning are just right at that place where we say, I've been thinking about these things. And this morning, I believe that Jesus really is the King of Kings who has died and risen from the dead, who has died for my wrongness and has risen from the dead so that I could have a life that's eternal too. So when we pray in a moment, some of us might want to pray for the first time, saying, Jesus, thank you that you died for me, please be my king. I'm sorry for all the wrong things I've done. I want to live for your honor now. So let's pray. And we're going to spend a few minutes praying. I'm going to pray. Then Chris is going to come and invite more of us to pray. So let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that we can share this morning. Thank you that we can read these words together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you continue to work. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you that you proved that you are alive. Thank you that you proved that you're the conqueror over death. Lord, let us head into this week with that encouragement and joy and certainty that you are the one who conquers death. You are the one who is risen, who is alive. Lord, we want to pray too that we would be those who rely on your promised Holy Spirit. Thank you that you pour out your spirit on all who call on your name. And we want to live in the power of your Holy Spirit this week empowered to be your witnesses, knowing your presence with us, experiencing relationship with you and with each other by the unity that your Holy Spirit's work among us brings. Lord, we worship you and we thank you for the Holy Spirit, for his work among us. And Lord, we thank you that you are the king poised, poised to return, the triumphant one. Lord, we pray that we would live in the light of your kingship this week, that we would make choices in the light of the truth that you are the king poised to return. Some of us here this morning, we might never have put our trust in you. And this morning, perhaps we hear you calling us, inviting us lovingly to your embrace. And perhaps some of us this morning for the first time want to say, that we are sorry for the wrong things that we've done. We want to say thank you that you, Jesus, died for me personally. You took my place on that cross so that I could be forgiven. Please forgive me. Please be my king. Please, by the work of your spirit in my life, Cleanse me and clean me and empower me to live for your glory. We worship you, Lord Jesus, and we pray in your glorious and mighty name.